Without objection. Now, first, Madam President, as you know, when I speak on the floor, I remove my mask. But today is a special reason to keep this mask on. This mask is made by Hickey Freeman in Rochester, New York, by American labor, union labor, by a grand and proud and generous company that's been in Rochester for in the last three decades, the 1800s, 1900s, and now the 2000s. It's a wonderful company. They have kept jobs, good paying jobs in America to make fine clothing. And they started making the masks to give them to a local hospital at cost. So I salute Hickey Freeman. I salute the great trades men and women who work there. And may they continue for hundreds more years providing jobs in Rochester and helping when we need help. Now, yesterday, House Democrats unveiled new legislation to combat the coronavirus pandemic. The American people need their government to act strongly, decisively, wisely. And this new legislation is the urgent and the necessary response to what this crisis demands. As any one of us could have guessed, the Republican leader is rather predictably responding against the House Democratic bill to address the COVID crisis. His response is predictable because for weeks, Leader McConnell has been preemptively slandering any legislation coming out of the House as, quote, a partisan wish list, long before he even saw the bill. It was a paint-by-numbers response from the Republican leader, continues to be. Didn't matter what was in the bill, in his eyes, not in the eyes of almost every American, it was going to be a far-left partisan wish list. And to fit the preordained narrative, last night, Senate Republicans were latching on to provisions that account for 0.0003% of the total bill. 0.0003%. Talk about grasping at straws. It is so predictable that the Republican leader would oppose the bill before he saw what's in it. And now that it is so necessary for so many Americans, it's predictable that Republicans are just saying no. The Republican leader also called the bill aspirational. The Republican leader should know it is not aspirational when a family can't feed their children. It is not aspirational when Americans, for the first time, are, about, are worried about losing their homes and being evicted from their apartments. It is not aspirational when Americans are facing a health crisis in which every one of us is afraid that we might come down with a dangerous illness or spread it to a loved one. It is not aspirational. We are talking about urgent and necessary relief. But out of reflective knee-jerk partisanship, the Republican leadership in the Senate basically declared the House bill dead on arrival before it was even announced. It's a shocking and incomprehensible position to take at this moment of national crisis. It would be one thing for the Republican leadership to say, well, let's sit down and negotiate. Let's talk about where both parties can come together to do something for this na the nation's well-being at this time of urgent crisis. But they have taken the position that there is absolutely no urgency to do anything at all. On Monday, here's what the Republican leader said. Republicans, he said, quote, have yet to feel the urgency to act immediately. What will it take? Are they so, so wrapped around a hard right ideology that they can't see the real needs of the American people? Is there no urgency on testing? Talk to your local businesses. Talk to your local mayors. Talk to your local governors. See if there's no urgency on testing. Is there no urgency to provide relief to renters and homeowners? No urgency to prevent firefighters, police officers, and teachers from being laid off by state and local governments whose budgets are underwater? 
in both blue and red states? I'd like to know how many of my Republican colleagues actually, actually oppose providing reassurance to state and local governments so that teachers in Iowa, firefighters in North Carolina, and police officers in Kentucky don't get laid off. The support our states need is in the House bill. It is very close to what the governors, Democrat and Republican, have asked for. Leader McConnell frequently highlights the heroism of our essential workers. I applaud him for that. But well, why don't we, in addition to giving speeches on the floor, put a little money in their pockets for the extra expenses they're undergoing? Why isn't there an urgency to provide them hazard pay? That's in the House bill. Leader McConnell and President Trump have placed a great emphasis on reopening the country as quickly as possible. That's something we all want to see. So how do we achieve that safely, far and away? The most important factor in reopening the economy is testing. We are far behind where we should be. Fauci made that clear yesterday, despite the President's lies and mistruths about testing. Remember, our President said on March 6th, I think it was, anyone who wants a test can have a test. That is even not true today. Deluding the American people, deluding, running from the truth to say what pops into your head so it sounds good to the media for that moment, which it seems to be the President's M.O., doesn't help, doesn't help. Everyone knows that until this crisis is over and on into the future, we're gonna need personal protective equipment to begin safely returning to work. As I mentioned, I wore on the floor this mask made in Rochester by Hickey Freeman well, the House bill, the House bill includes crucial support for supply chain and manufacturing of PPP. Should we wait on that? Is that not urgent? An ambulance worker, a healthcare worker not having the PPE they need? Not urgent? Who believes that? Does Leader McConnell, does President Trump, to our Republican colleagues? It is just baffling, baffling that at this time of probably the greatest crisis we have faced, both health and economic, in decades, that Senate, the Senate Republican leadership, instead of working with Democrats to find common ground on these crucial issues, has decided it will begin taking, it will be against taking urgent and necessary action to help the American people in a time of national crisis. Unless, of course, that means liability protections for big corporations. That seems to be their number one concern. Mr. President, or Madam President, more than 30 million Americans are now unemployed. More than 80,000 Americans have died. Just how many lost jobs, lost businesses, lost lives will it take before Senate Republicans begin to feel the urgency? Now, on another matter. Last week, Americans learned that the Trump White House had blocked release by the Center for Disease Control of a document that contained guidance for safely reopening up the country. According to media reports, this guidance was painstakingly prepared by the CDC to help the country determine when and how to begin easing social distancing without causing undue risk to public health, further spread of COVID, the reoccurrence of a second wave, and more infections and more deaths. The CDC guidance included detailed information and flowcharts to help guide states, local governments, businesses, schools, churches and religious institutions, and individuals as they consider these very challenging questions. Businesses want to know how and when to open. Citizens want to know how they should behave to protect themselves, yet get the country open. The CDC guidance includes detailed information and flowcharts to help. Now, a version of this document appeared in the media, but we still don't have the official document as completed by the CDC. Of course, every American, regardless of where they live or what party they belong to, wants to get back to normal as quickly as possible. I know every member of the Senate wants that to happen as soon as it possibly can. I certainly do. 
but making the wrong decisions about when, where, and how fast to reopen could result in the loss of precious lives that could be otherwise saved and in the recurrence of a COVID second wave that, God forbid, could be worse than the first. In order to make these decisions widely, the country needs guidance of the nation's best medical and scientific experts. These literally are matters of life and of death. And that's exactly why the CDC prepared this guidance. But the White House has blocked the release of the CDC guidance, reportedly so the President and his political appointees can make changes to it. Now, as we all know, the President is not a doctor. The President is not a scientist. Many don't even believe he's a stable genius, like he thinks he is. It has become painfully clear over the last two months how unfamiliar he is with the disciplines of science and medicine. Anyone who would say, drink bleach, use bleach to protect yourself is not much of a medical expert. So it's difficult, if not impossible, to imagine any legitimate constructive purpose in a desire by the President or his staff to edit the CDC's work. I wish President Trump and his aides could be trusted to tell the American people the truth about this public health crisis. I wish they could be trusted not to engage in political censorship of the medical and scientific judgments of our nation's foremost experts. But at this point in the crisis, after all the falsehoods, all the disinformation, all the transparent attempts at political spin, every American knows full well that the President and his staff simply cannot be trusted to tell the truth about the coronavirus. Just yesterday, the President claimed that COVID-19 cases are falling everywhere in America. But another report, also yet to be released by the President's own Coronavirus Task Force, is said to show that infection rates are spiking to new heights in a large number, in a number of large and small communities around the country, places in Tennessee and Iowa, Texas and Kentucky. The point is that America needs and must have the candid guidance of our best scientists, unfiltered, unedited, uncensored by President Trump or his political minions. The CDC report on reopening the country is an important piece of that guidance. The Senate should unanimously support the uncensored release of that document. And therefore, I will now offer a very simple and brief unanimous consent request, and I hope all senators will support it. So I ask unanimous consent. The Senate proceed to the immediate consideration of Senate Resolution 572 expressing the sense of the Senate that the report of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention entitled, quote, Guidance for Implementing the Opening Up of America Again Framework be released immediately. I further ask that the resolution be agreed to and that the motions to reconsider be considered, made, and laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. Is there objection? Reserving the right to, Madam President. The Senator from Indiana. Reserving the right to object. The argument that the White House and Task Force have been not been transparent, in my mind, is a faux argument from the min minority leader. He's really trying to let career regulators at agencies like the CDC bog down the economy, again with bureaucratic hurdles. I would probably know that as well as any senator here because I spent 12 years ago fighting to reform health care. It's related agencies that bog the system down, a system that gives us a health care cost that is double that of any other across the country. We'll get back to that. Eighty senators on both sides of the aisle weighed in on that before the coronavirus raised its ugly head. The White House and tax, uh, Task Force have been beyond transparent in the midst of this outbreak, indeed holding unprecedented amount of daily press briefings and allowing for a free flow of information that has been central to the White House's reopening efforts. This is not 
about transparency. The White House is always going to be in favor of transparency. The president comes from a world of entrepreneurs where we embrace it in competition. This is about the minority leader trying to use the bureaucracy at the CDC to bog down the economy. We have got to, from this point forward, make sure that we adhere to everything the health care experts have told us, but we've got to be able to do a couple things at once, and that means a smart restart to the economy. The CDC and other health agencies were targets of the White House deregulation efforts from day one. They were the most challenging regulatory agencies to rein in. The Democrats and bureaucrats who are content with the status quo have been blocking efforts to deregulate since President Trump took office. How we can do that when decades have brought us to the point with the health care system in general doesn't make sense to a Main Street entrepreneur like me that has found that a different dynamic works. The CDC, for example, was in the driver's seat during the initial stages of the outbreak. Their missteps on testing forced us to take a one-size-fits-all approach, which didn't make sense to many of us. We could have handled this in a way that's not putting us now on the precipice of an even greater calamity. The inability to conduct early and wide testing in the U.S. caused by the CDC's and FDA's overly prescriptive stodginess prolonged the testing process in the early stages when it should have been expedited. The result has been that one-size-fits-all that we're contending with currently. We now lead the world in testing thanks to the White House's efforts to fight off the regulatory swamp at D CDC and fix the testing problems caused by regulators. I submitted to the record yesterday in that over two-hour briefing with the health care experts that timeline refer to it. It happened from late January through early March. Senator Schumer wants to release the CDC's version of the reopening guidance. But the White House and senior health officials have rejected the initial CDC recommendations in that version because the recommendations were overly prescriptive, infringed upon religious rights, and risked further damaging the economy. Are we really going to let the CDC shutter the economy a second time, like they did with testing, by dictating overly prescriptive guidelines. President Trump's deregulatory agenda has proven to be an immediate success because we have gone from initially mired in bureaucratic hurdles to leading the world in testing and successfully flattening the curve and fighting the virus. Spoke to a CEO of a pharmaceutical company headquartered in, in, in Indiana, said the very same thing. They were stymied from the get-go he, among other pharmaceutical companies, have put together an entrepreneurial effort to tackle this. It's not going to be done by trying to tie their hands. They're close to getting testing to where it's going to work for all of us. I have a business three of my four kids run. We want to make sure we have testing to make sure that we can bring employees into a health and healthy environment and take care of customers. All businesses share that concern. The minority leader and Democrats do not want to reopen the economy because I think, frankly, we had the best one I've ever seen in the 37 years I was a CEO of a Main Street company that went from a little company like the minority leader always talks about. We share that common interest. I was disappointed when the PPP did come out that they weren't helped first. We got that fixed. Let's stay focused on that. We keep moving the goalposts for reopening. If we do that, we risk, in economic terms, what's called demand and supply destruction. And there would not be enough federal dollars to remedy that. The White House proactively gave us the appropriate roadmap to get the economy back on track. We should not leave something as important as reopening the country to career regulators at the CDC 
an agency that set back our response efforts due to their overly prescriptive approach. U.S. testing exploded once the White House efforts to increase testing fight off the regulatory bureaucrats when that won out. The same thing will happen with reopening the economy using the reopening guidance as a roadmap under the President's leadership. I object. Mr. Mad Madam President. Objection is heard. Madam President. Democratic leaders recognize. Just two quick points. Number one, my friend, and he is my friend, from Indiana said, the White House has always believed in transparency, has always been transparent and believed in transparency. Does any American believe that? Does any senator believe that? Does my friend from Indiana actually believe that the White House has always been transparent? And second, he has said that America leads the world in testing. Does any independent scientist believe that? Is there anyone who believes we're leading in testing that we've done, as President Trump said, and a great accom accomplished everything in testing? Does anyone outside the White House and their acolytes believe that? I doubt it. I yield the floor.